Good afternoon, and welcome to the Center for Disasters Philanthropy webinar, Breaking Beyond Breaking News, Local Journalism's Role in Disaster Recovery. My name is Paul Chun, and I'm a member of CDP's Board of Directors. But in my day job, I run the Center for Public Integrity, an investigative nonprofit based in DC. Our mission is to expose inequality and equip the public with knowledge to drive change. Um, and you know, we also do a lot of journalism around um, environmental justice. Um, and that's why I'm passionate about CDP's mission. Um, some housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, for those who have questions, you can submit questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the panel presentation. Also, at the end of the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete this to help us improve our webinar offering so that we could better serve your needs. And finally, we are recording this webinar. It will be available on our website and YouTube channel um, after the webinar is complete. Live captioning is available via Zoom. Please click on closed caption live transcript to access that. You can also access it in languages other than English. However, they might be in accuracy and most accurate captions will be available in the recording. And we want to thank our co-sponsors, this webinar is presented and co-sponsored by the Council on Foundations, Giving Compress, Media Impact Funders, Philanthropy New York, and United Philanthropy Forum. We thank them all for their support for this program today. As we begin the webinar, CDP acknowledged it work on the stolen lands of many original peoples. We recognize that indigenous people have been displaced and disenfranchised from their land, by the socioeconomic and cultural impact of colonialism and disasters. The erasure of indigenous knowledge about how to care for these lands have caused environmental destruction and degradations. CDP is committed to dismantling the ongoing legacies, systems, and structures of settler colonialism and white supremacy and the connection to philanthropy today and in the future. Despite centuries of death, violence, and murder, this is still and always be indigenous land. Please join us in acknowledging the original people and their elders and past, present, and future generations. At the end of this webinar, you know, we hope that some of the key insight for you is to understand how funders can increase their support for local journalism, um, which is at a crisis today. Um, learn about the difference between national and local media disaster recovery coverage, and also awareness of the various roles played by photography, audio, print, TV, and digital journalism. Let's take a look at the result of the poll that you have took um, earlier. But well, it's encouraging to know that um, most people have some understanding of local media's role in disaster coverage. And I see there's a lot of opportunities for funders and donors to support more local journalism in terms of these disaster recovery. And today we're fortunate to um, curate a great group of journalists and um, funders um, that is a mix of local and national. Um, so we have Glenn Gamboa. He's the philanthropy editor at the Associated Press. He's an award-winning journalist who brings rigorous reporting and fair and writing fair to everything from a daily blog post to special sessions and multi-day series. He previously, he had led Newsday's coverage of the influence of hip hop that was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in explanatory reporting. His work had also been published in Wire, CNN, um, Alternative Press, and numerous newspaper. And he, he has appeared as an expert on the music industry on BBC, NPR, CNN, various TV and radio station. So um, thank you for joining us, Glenn. Um, next, we have the director of photography, Hu Ying Kyung. Um, she is joining us today from Texas Tribune's photo team um, based in Texas, um, Central Texas. 
who stopped working for the Tribune as a freelancer in 2017, really documenting um, Hurricane Harvey's um, catastrophe um, flooding in Houston. And soon after, Pooh moved to Bogota, Colombia, where she honed her Spanish and created a moving body of work on the plight of migrants who have fled the decade-long economic and political crisis in Venezuela. Her work has appeared in many outlets, including Reuters, Al Jazeera English, Vice, ProPublica, NBC News, and NPR. And the last panelist we have joining us today is Vince Staley. He's the Executive Director of Media Impact Funder, a membership-based philanthropic serving organization that advanced the work on a broad range of funders committed to the effective use and support of media in the public interest. Um, prior to that, Vince is a program director at the Sudra Foundation, a family foundation based in New York City. He has more than 10 years of experience reporting for the Chronicle of Philanthropy, covering a broad range of issues in nonprofit sector. Um, he served as the chairperson of Philanthropy New York and on the governing board of Volunteer Match, the nonprofit technology network and the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Glenn, why don't we start with you first? Um, you know, with CP, CDP's webinar, are looking for signs of hope this year. And, you know, AP has a great year. Um, recently, the AP had got a big grant from the Lilly Endowment that allowed the AP to hire not just a reporter, but really a, a team of people focusing on climate change and disaster recovery. What are you? What is the role of funder in, in helping media tell this story? And why is it more important you know, today to have funders supporting um, places like the AP and other local news in terms of doing um, story on disaster and disaster um, recovery. Uh, thanks, Paul. I, I really like the idea of starting with 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 some hope, um, and and basically, uh, we we started with a, an initial grant. Philanthropy coverage at the AP started with an initial grant from the Lilly Foundation, or the Lilly Endowment, and. Um, and this year they've decided to expand their their um their donation to include some new some new areas of of coverage and one of them that we're most excited about is is this new position for covering uh for covering disasters we we kind of think that uh across the board journalists do a pretty good job at covering the immediate response of a disaster the first response the, the first responders getting people out of danger and into safety we we think that that's pretty well covered and we also think that uh people do a pretty good job in terms of the initial recovery making sure that people once they're out of immediate danger you know at least have a a safe place to stay um uh, the, the you know the kind of the first week the first two weeks after the the after the initial disaster we think that that's covered pretty well as well and um and as the ap as an as an international news source we we do that around the world several you know unfortunately more and more often but uh you know several times a week um what 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 our new position is going to focus on is the rebuilding part. Taking a look at at, at the disaster area six months, a year after uh, after the disaster, and seeing how things are going, what things are working well, and what things aren't. It's a way to kind of. It's not necessarily accountability, although that would be part of it. It's all. It's just to take a look at what has been working and what hasn't. We're hoping that we can bring some ideas of what has been successful to a wider audience so that they can be used in future in, in future disasters that are similar. Yeah. Glenn, and, you know, could you basically help us unpack a little bit? As you mentioned, AP cover literally disasters on a weekly level, right? Both um, big and small, international and national. Why do you think the time is right now for AP to actually think about beyond covering the disaster and the immediate recovery. What is the significance of having a dedicated resources that look at long-term recovery as a beat? Why is that um, important right now? Yeah, I mean, the main reason is because disasters, especially 
uh, especially those related to climate change, are becoming more uh, common. Uh, and and because they're more common, there's more money flowing to them uh, on a regular basis. And we and we wanted to cover the effectiveness of that money, and we wanted to make sure that that money was being used as well as it can be used. And we think that this position will be able to kind of investigate that a little bit deeper. And I think that that, and, you know, money is finite. And in in a time like this, I think that that's the main reason we wanted to add this position. And what was Lily and Dowman's um, sort of primary interest in this? Sort of like, why Lily and not some other um, funders that you're working with? If yeah, you could share I, some insight. Uh, yeah, sure. Lily, the Lily Endowment is the only funder for the philanthropy department. And um, their interest, uh, broadly stated, is they they want to bring coverage of philanthropy and the idea of philanthropy to as broad a mainstream audience as they can. And and they're helping, they're they're asking us to focus on issues. And, and coverage areas where they where they think we can bring the most uh, where where they think we'll get the most attention, and uh, disaster coverage is something that the AP does very well and very often, and they felt that adding this other component would would help bring a broader audience to what philanthropy does. Yeah, that's amazing. So for any funders out there, again, I love that um, they are highlighting the importance of funding the coverage of philanthropy, but really giving AP that flexibility to choose on a subject, you know, as important as this disaster recovery as a way to sort of advance um, both Lilly and AP's mission. Um, and so the last thing is like, what is it that, because AP is everywhere, but you guys are also like, not local. What what are some of the what can local journalism do that AP cannot? Yeah, um, the, the AP tries to make it, it makes its news available to uh, around the world, and it tries to focus on the things that are of interest to people around the world. Those those things are not necessarily the same things that someone recovering from a specific disaster would need. They need. Where do I go, you know, to to sign up for FEMA? What, what shelters are, you know, less crowded than the one that I'm per currently in? Uh, and we can't get, we don't normally write to that level of specificity. And um, you, you have the slide here about local news deserts. This is kind of a prevention thing uh, to talk about. There are 209 counties, which are in yellow here on the on the graphic that don't have any news source whatsoever. And so were there to be a disaster in those areas, there's very little information, infrastructure for uh, residents to turn to. The light blue areas, which is about a thousand, a little more than a thousand counties in the country are areas that only have one source. And those are, those are a varying quality and varying ability to kind of get this information out there as well. And then the blue areas, which are kind of focused on the coast, are areas that have what what the local news initiative calls, uh, you know, a, a more than two sources, but also a, a pretty robust coverage of that area. Thanks, Glenn. Um, well, you, you know, as we talk about the importance of loco, I want to ask you um, who I want you to ask you a question in, you know, about Texas Tribune and what is your approach to covering disaster and why is it important for local news to have the capacity to cover disasters? You know, I, I think the Texas Tribune is an interesting example because when it first started, it was very local to Austin. And since then, we've really, you know, expanded. We have regional bureaus now, and now local takes on a different meaning. We are very, um, you know, focused on the communities of the state of Texas. Um, why, why is it important, you know, to, to tap into people um, from their communities to cover their communities? Um, I, I can be a case study for you. Before I was uh, the director of photography, um, I was a freelance photographer in Houston, and I actually 
I think Texas Tribune was one of my first clients. Um, and when Hurricane Harvey, um, you know, wrecked habit in, in Houston, um, they, they, they tapped me in to cover, you know, the immediate aftermath. And I want to, you know, during the slide in the middle photo on the right column, this gives, this picture gives our viewers, you know, kind of an understanding of what the city looked like at the time. And I think there's a real benefit to, you know, having grown up in this town, knowing how to navigate it, having a familiarity with the geography that is so crucial to reporting especially in the like immediate aftermath, right? You want to be able to hit the ground running. You want to know where your rain boots are in the closet and, you know, all the gear that um, you need to have because as someone who grew up in Houston, you know, these kind of things happen, not to the scale of Harvey, but you, you kind of have that familiarity. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I'll say is that in the immediate aftermath, you know, I think we do cover that well. Um, you know, national media also came in, but I think it's in the time afterwards, and I'm talking about months, six months, years, you know, what happens after the news cycle has moved on, that's where local media really fills in a need. Um, there's countless stories, but if you don't have local journalists on the ground, you know, building those relationships with people and really taking the time to follow up, then these stories get lost and you you lose a part of what what kind of devastation or impact these storms have um, for, you know, the greater audience. Yeah, and as a question, you know, for Huyin, I just want you to elaborate a little bit. For those who are not familiar with the news industry, when you say mm -hmm. the news cycle and we move on from it, like, could you just elaborate that a little bit? Like, what do you mean when we move on from a news cycle? Sure. I think we, we all know, you know, when disaster strikes, um, our phones, the TV, you know, like almost all our, the, the digital applications and TV what or whatnot, you know, we, we get bombarded with like, this is what's happening. This street is flooding, you know, uh, this is where uh, people are having to evacuate. And these are the like, you know, um, shelters where people are going. There's, there's a moment in news in the news cycle where we, are fixated on this um, event. Um, a lot of times what's happening is, you know, if, if, it, if it rises to the occasion, you have national media coming in to cities. Um, and then of course, you know, the local journalists are always also there. There's this whole ecosystem of journalists that are on the scene working to, you know, report and, you know, make imagery video of like what is going on. Um, when the news cycle moves on, that's when you start seeing people, you know, leave town and less journalists are in town until, you know, you know, you think about it, like the, the less people you have covering, then like the less you're seeing it and the less the general public is seeing it. Um, that, that's kind of what I mean by like the news cycle moves on. You it, it kind of starts drifting out of people's minds. Yeah, that really talks about the importance of having a strong local media ecosystem. Vince, to just bring you into the conversation, you know, you and I know that local media has a critical play role to play in, you know, especially in the aftermath of a crisis. Like, what are some of the examples that you have that funders have made to cover disasters? Oh, Vince, I think you're mute. Of course, I was muted. Um, uh, it's a great honor to be included in this panel, uh, and really, uh, it's wonderful to have the 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 views of the reporters who are actually doing the work. Uh, I think that's really illuminating. From our perspective, we see a lot going on, and uh, it's um, it's never enough, but it is encouraging to see the level of activity. Uh, and so, there's there's a lot of grant making that's that's going on. I think the most recent example that we're familiar with at Media Impact Funders is actually um, uh, in the wake of the Maui fires, um, the Honolulu Civil Beat reached out to us and um, because we had featured them in some programming and they were hoping to respond to, to the fires themselves. And we were able to put them in touch with our good friends at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy um, 
who were able to make a grant, a grant of $250,000 to Honolulu Civil Beat for their coverage. So I'll just acknowledge the, the generosity of our partners uh, in this program. Um, and that that was a, a really important response because they hadn't um, traditionally had a lot of coverage, but they had just placed a reporter on Maui. So they actually had somebody present, but they needed to increase their their coverage uh, in the wake of the fires and CDP was able to contribute to that. And then there are many, many other examples uh, from the, the larger foundations like the Rockefeller Foundations in the wake of, um, of the Hurricane Maria, they provided a $200,000 grant to the Miami Herald for coverage uh, following up on Maria down to a smaller scale, the Global Green Grants Program has grants from $1,500 to $25,000. And just one example of that would be a grant of $15,000 to the Marañón Water Keepers for Communications Outreach Campaign after flooding in the Amazon back in 2019. That gives you a kind of a range of what's possible. I think one of the most notable um, philanthropic responses, and this relates to the picture on the screen, that iconic picture that we might all remember from hurricanes, um, the, the, the superstorm Sandy, which devastated the coast of New Jersey, um, that had a huge impact uh, in that community and all the way up um, through New York and into the, into the New England states. Um, but in the wake of that, there were a number of grant makers in New Jersey, and most notably the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, who had already begun to make um, uh, uh, the kind of path-breaking grants in local journalism, nonprofit, online news, and other local journalism activities. Um, this was work that was led by Molly de Aguiar, who's now at the Independence Public Media Foundation. Uh, but she uh, was able to um, engage a number of other funders uh, the Patterson Foundation, the Rita Allen Foundation, uh, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, as well as the Center for Disaster Philanthropy in creating a collaborative effort, uh, which was the Hurricane Sandy Inform and Engage Fund. And I think we'll post a link to that. It's a really interesting report because they really focused on this last point that Hu Ying and, and Glenn, I think, were addressing was what happens after the disaster that we're all paying attention to in the daily news of the disaster, what happens a month later, months later. And so the coverage supported by that Inform and Engage project um, was very thoughtfully designed to do the follow-up, the policy work, the, 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 the council meetings and the, the zoning and all of that kind, kind of coverage. So that provides, I think, a, a range of the kind of responses that philanthropy can, can offer. And Hu Ying, um, to just circle back with you, you know, in some of the call, we talk a lot about sort of story, especially in a lot of mainstream media that don't get to surface. But you, as someone who has the connection with the local community, get to tell it differently. Could you sort of shed some light on what are some of these stories that don't often get into like the CNN of the world, but because you are local, you're able to really reflect that story for those unique communities? Um, this slide here, I think is like one of my favorite projects um, in the aftermath of um, the winter storm 2021 in Texas. Um, record low temperatures that, you know, caused just statewide catastrophe with the power supply. A lot of people, you know, we're, we're down south. We were not used to snow or ice. <laughs> Um, and it left millions of people without access to electricity. We covered it in the, you know, immediate, you know, once it happened. But what I really appreciate about this story is that this is a look back one year later. And the multimedia team and the photo team, um, you know, worked together to call people across the state. Um, some of them people that we had covered a year before um, and asked them to, do a you know re reflection piece of um, you know tell us like what what have you learned what was the experience like and I think what was what was so moving about this was you know 
you for me I, I felt like the the community you know through the relationships that the journalists had felt and you know giving them an opportunity to call in and share their story um it, it really speaks to the kind of relationships like on the ground that um people when as local journalists you're able to build and still revisit some of these people a year afterwards to you know get get that reflection i mean people were you you could hear in their voice you know because it was there's was audio involved here you could hear in their voice you know what that experience was some people even faint <laughs> the tribune like i i thank you for even giving me a chance to think about what this experience was. Um, I, I think it's really important that people see their stories reflected in media. Um, you know, there's there's a myriad of emotions and stories that surface after the immediate event, you know? And it's that that's why it's important to maintain those relationships because when you go back and visit, you know, talk with them, um, you're able to uncover maybe some of the trauma that's happening and what people can do about it. Um, you also get a sense of, you know, knowing that, hey, I'm feeling this way and my neighbors are also struggling. Um, that, you know, that's those are the ways in which I think, you know, local media, you know, doing a piece like this, might, maybe CNN would would have done a piece like this. <laughs> um, but I, I thought it was it was like a really special example. Yeah. And when we think about, you know, the media, right, like, right. especially, I feel like we all get lumped into one when there's so many different branches of media, we have digital media, right, we have television, we have radio, we have for profit, um, you know, we have nonprofit like Texas Tribune, and then we have like not for profit like the AP, you know, Vince, the question, you know, for you is, you know, as we, we think about um, other platforms in terms of, um things like radio, like why is it important for donors and philanthropy to invest beyond <laughs> sort of like the medias that they're most familiar with? Why is it important for them to invest in local radio? Why is it important for them to invest in a nonprofit like Texas Tribune, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, the Center for Public Integrity? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, it's our constant uh, drumbeat to try to encourage more philanthropy to support the, the whole range of media in the public interest, all of the uh, different media formats. Um, but I do think that radio has a special role in disaster preparedness and also um, information after the events happen. Um, there... I think one one point is looking at if we if we're thinking about the news desert map, actually radio covers a lot of those deserts. Radio actually covers public radio in particular, covers about ninety eight percent of the territory of the U.S. So all those um, all those tan areas in the map from a, a couple of slides back, those are reached through public media, and a radio is a particularly durable and resilient medium. Um, in a disaster, it's only the most extreme uh, cases where the tower actually comes down and the generators stop working. The radio usually survives the disasters that come through. And from a kind of digital divide standpoint, there's no lack of bandwidth. There's no lack of Wi-Fi coverage. Everybody has a transistor radio in their go bag. Uh, whatever you know, event happens, you usually have access to some radio, maybe it's your, um, not your most popular tool on a daily basis, but when the lights go out and the Wi-Fi goes down, your little transistor radio still works. So that's a really important coverage kind of point. Um, and then uh, the other point is that, um, particularly when it comes to public media, the public safety role of public media is one of its fundamental cases for existing. And particularly when they go to the federal government for resources, they make the case that actually the early, award, uh, early alerts or warning systems um, is one of the reasons why uh, public media, public radio exists. They even have a, a FEMA program that's currently operating about $100 million, $96 million in FEMA grants for public radio. And so that's, I think, a good example where a public-private partnership, your 
foundation grants can, um, in a way, double your value in in disaster preparedness and uh, and response when you think about the FEMA dollars that are going to the same systems. And if you can support with reporting capacity what the public dollars are providing for technical capacity, we get a bigger bang for our buck in philanthropy in philanthropy. Yeah, just to stay on this point, right? So, you know, recently there's a very exciting announcement, Press Forward announced with, you know, 500 million to really catalyze no code news and, you know, MacArthur Foundation and Knight Foundation, uh, yeah. you know, the Lee investor, you know, $500 million sounds a lot, but it's actually very, very little, right? The annual revenue for Starbucks for last year was $35 billion. 35 billion for coffee and yeah. muffins, right? Versus 500 million for all of local news, right? So my question to you is what can the people who are dialing in today, you yeah. know, you know, how, why is it important for them to actually start thinking local news as a funding strategy, especially yeah. in context of, um, you know, disaster recovery and disaster coverage? Yeah. Well, I think there's a, a long way to go still. I mean, I think the, the what MacArthur and Knight and 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 twenty other foundations in the in the ground floor on Press Forward, uh, and many other foundations that are coming to Press Forward local in Minnesota and in other communities uh, that are underway now are seeing that there's huge opportunities to increase on that sort of upfront five hundred million dollar commitment at the launch. But I think the other um, maybe optimistic thing to say is we're very happy to be the, the host for the Media Grants database, which you see uh, uh, here on, on the, the slide, um, which shows who's funding what and where in Media Grants globally. Um, and already there are thousands of foundations that are making journalism grants, as indicated here, over over time from 2009, which is the lifespan of this of this media grants database, um, there's already three and a half billion dollars that have been given by philanthropy. There's much more uh, that can be done, but there is a, a basis of uh, of increasing. And so I think what what we would say, at media impact funders, is you may not even know you're making media grants because it may be somebody in another program down the hall who's made a, a grant to a quarterly magazine or some, maybe the local public radio station, but there's some base of practice that we can build on. And in addition, most importantly, you can find partners for that work through this data database. And so I think that our encouragement would be find the partners who are doing this work in your community and do what the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation did a few, you know, a few years back, and find the partners who together you can really solve this problem with. Yeah, and that's really important, right? So for more funders to think about, I mean, especially in context of, um, you know, as, as Glenn and Puying allude that disaster recovery, there's sort of this uh, hyper awareness in your first twenty four, even maybe twenty four hours, maybe even a week or a month out. But really, like as some of the comments I'm seeing is, some people are still recovering from Hurricane Sandy. Puerto Rico is still um, dealing with the athletic effects of Hurricane Maria, right? So, you know, so when we think about like the long-term effects to a community, it literally take a lot of effort and a lot of funding to be able to keep that issue sort of, you know, at, at bay. And so, you know, playing for you guys, you know, as a nonprofit in Texas Tribune, like, how important is it for you to actually engage with your local for your local funders to support your work? Like what 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 can your work do if you suddenly get another million dollars? It's a beautiful question. <laughs> Paul. Um, you know, I, I'm really encouraged by some of the the comments and questions I, I see in the the, the chat because um, I, I sense that you know people want to hear these stories. They they want for media to to stay after longer than the first you know 48 hours. Let me tell you something. We we do too. 
You know, like we want to cover these stories. You want to look into, you know, whether the city, you know, used their funds right, if, you know, if the, you know, funding was distributed correctly, you know, investigations, you know, I think is what I'm trying to get at. Like th things that take a long time, a lot of work, um, you know, it's not something you can just turn around in a day or a week. Um, documentary, photo work, like all of this takes time. And, and when we get funding, what, what does that do? Maybe, maybe that might be helpful for some people. Like what, what does that money actually do? We have to get out there in the field, right? I mean, that means we have to drive cars that may look like rentals, that may be our own personal vehicles. We have mileage, we have to eat. There are places to, you know, stay. Um, you know, kind of going back to Harvey, um, we ended up covering Harvey. I mean, I think we still cover Harvey, like some... <laughs> Like I remember uh, here, like seeing a Harvey article just last year. So we're still, you know, keeping up with um, how people are are dealing with that aftermath. But what I wanted to say was, in the aftermath, we decided this story is too big for us to, for a lot of the Tribune reporters to go back to Austin. So what did they do? Rented an apartment, you know, in Houston, so that some of the reporters could stay there and work, continue working talking to people and uncovering some of the things that, you know, people what needed to know in the aftermath of the, of the, of the storm. Um, they, th this is the kind of <laughs> the, the funding, like if, you know, we got um, a, a giant sum of money, um, the newsroom would very quickly, you know, rally to, to figure out like what, what, where do we need to, you know, focus and prioritize. And then um, that would help us, be able to that the logistics that goes into long long form reporting. Yeah, I think you know, Glenn. Maybe you could talk more about this, but I think a lot of folks actually underestimate how much it costs to to actually not just tell a good story, but tell it in a way that is truthful, accurately, and fair. And also, you know as some of the, the funding you say, you're holding philanthropy accountable. You're holding sort of like bad actors accountable. I do think a lot of folks underestimate how much resources it take to do some of these, you know, reporting and some of these investigated. So how do you, you know, build that relationship with your funder, right? Because even for, and your donors, because people want to see that immediate return. Right. They want to be basically saying that I give you X amount of money. You know, I want to see like, OK, you have hold this person accountable. Why are we not seeing these stories? How do you manage that? How do you articulate that relationship with your funders so that they understand that like quality journalism does take time and it does take resources? Yeah, I think that um one of the things at the AP is that our uh, our relationship with funders is is at arm's length. I I I don't really talk to uh, folks from the Lilly Endowment directly. Uh, there there are <clears throat> there are people that they deal with directly who then filter that information of what they're looking for uh, to my to my bosses who and then it comes to me. Uh, I think that. You know, because of journalism, we we very much are um, worried about and and ensure that there is no direct uh, influence uh, from things that we're that we're covering or from money that we're taking. Uh, but in terms of in terms of um, donors trying to get their information out through the through the journalists, uh, you know, they're they're definitely many people who can help you tell your story lots of great communications people that would that would uh, tell you basically the same thing but it's a matter of getting your facts together picking how you want to tell that story and then choosing who it is that would be the best person to tell that story sometimes that's a reporter from outside your organization sometimes that's your ceo or sometimes it's a celebrity. It, it it kind of depends on the story that you want to tell and how you want to tell it. You know, as we sort of um, close the session into um, Q&A, um, for each one of you, um, what will be your message to the audience here? 
Like, why should they care about media coverage of disaster? Why is it important that get funded? So if, you know, Glenn, Puing, and Vince, if you guys have like a very 30 second, like advice, what would it be? Sure. I mean, for me, I think that people going through a disaster are at, at one of the worst points in their lives. And they need as much support as they can get and good journalism informing them of what they need to know is, is essential at that point. And I think that funding to make sure that those journalism outlets exist is, is essential. I think Glenn, you know, really nailed it. I, there might be, I think these days it's, it's easy to forget the value of information, like solid accurate information. Uh, I think a lot of people think you can just, you know, scroll over to TikTok or Instagram and, you know, like, okay, this, this is it. I'm going to, like Glenn said, in, in, especially after disasters, you need journalists on the ground that are able going to, that are able to provide, you know, essential information and kind of, you know, on a higher level here, um, what this entire talk, all of us have been talking about today to also stay afterwards like those stories are incredibly important because it also shapes um you know what government may do it, it's a, you know it's stories about accountability that's to prevent you know other disasters or you know um, to help people in a more effective way after disasters that all matters in the long run yeah you know it's, i would say mm -hmm. for the philanthropic point of view um i think that Everyone in the community who experiences the onset of a disaster says, like, what can I do? How can I help? And that's true in philanthropic circles, too. I can remember when I was chair of Philanthropy New York, we would have meetings and committees and task force. What can we do in the response to 9-11 or Hurricane Katrina? Even we, we actually hosted in New York a philanthropic response to Katrina. Um, and so philanthropy has a a, a, a good um, sort of reaction to uh, disasters, like what can we do? Well, one of the most important things and one of the easiest things to do uh, where it may be hard if you're in philanthropy and you're not a, a disaster professional, you know, with tactics and logistics and uh, to know exactly what to do, but information is always useful. And so helping provide clarity of information for preparedness and also for relief um, is an easy way for philanthropy to do something useful. Um, and also conversely, it's um, for anybody who's thinking about like, um, maybe we should get involved in support of journalism. It's also uh, a, an easy way into, into the practice of journalism too, because it's quite clear that this is a urgent need for information. And particularly yeah, in times of disinformation, is it um, most especially uh, useful? Um, and, and that, I think, is like the, the recent experience of the response to COVID was that extra layer of th the importance and the value of good information against the ubiquity of really dangerous, damaging, bad information. And so all of those things contribute to, I think, a, a level of urgency and opportunity for philanthropy. And so questions from the audience, um, and this is sort of a, a good question for Glenn and, and Puying, is does the lack of coverage sort of like after recovery, you know, beyond the new cycle, like, is it because it doesn't sell? Like, sort of like, is this something new that we decided to focus on long-term recovery or is always there? It's just not capturing the, the you know, it doesn't get into the public zeitgeist because it's like a year later, two years later, it's just not as sexy. Can you shed some light on, on that? Like, has news just been ignoring recovery or do we actually do it, but it just not surfaced to the attention as the immediate disaster? Um, I'll start Yang if that's okay. Um, I, th I think that one thing that we're seeing in terms of the, uh, all the layoffs in journalism and all the, uh, all the closings of newspapers is that journalists are very, very in tune with what their readers want. 
And if readers are no longer interested in, on, on a national, international scale uh, about a specific disaster, especially if there's another one that just happened, you know, the next day, they can't cover it because they just don't have the resources. It's not a matter of what sells, although it is on some level, but it's the reason that it doesn't sell is because the viewership and the readership is just not there for it. Yeah, I, I echo what, what Glenn says. I mean, like, you know, you want to look, at, look into insurance, you know, for example, it's not sexy, <laughs> you know, like if you, if, um, you know, some organizations, if they're tracking who, uh, how many eyeballs are on this one story, like you may see that it, you know, just never really rises. That doesn't mean it's not important. And, you know, to kind of answer the question, like we still do those stories. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's a finite amount of resources that gets spread around and we are constantly having to pivot and decide what is um, coverage priorities. And if it's a question for you from the, you know, as you interface with a lot of funders, right? Um, how do you make a point to the funders that they should fund these very unsexy things like insurance, right? Or like an investigation to like, you know, handling of like recovery budget, because a lot of times like you don't see that immediate return. And so what are some of the, some of your thoughts in terms of, you know, making sure that the, the funders are thinking about these very unsexy topic that might have like a big impact down the line? Funders are a wonderfully unsexy bunch of people. Um, they're just very comfortable in their unsexiness, unsexy a flat pair of shoes and everything's fine. But um, uh, seriously, I think that funders are, are comfortable in the minutia of their work. And so if their work is in um, environment or, um, you know, um, economic development, they're actually comfortable with thick reports and you know serious work, um, and they don't need flash. Uh, you reach them in the seriousness of their program area, and I think that's really the opportunity is to 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 meet them where they are. And um, you know, uh, I don't know if there are any philanthropic programs on insurance per se, but in economic development terms, you know, they look at those, those kind of resources. Uh, and so I think um, there are only a handful of foundations who have dedicated media programs, journalism programs, and actually most of the media grants flow through other programs. So meet them where they are, talk in the language of those program areas, and it, it doesn't have to be tarted up. Um, and another really great question from the audience is, what if your local news is owned by a Hearst or Gannett and not nonprofit, you know, but they want to see more robust newsroom. So how do you, how, you know, the folks are just not sure how do you fund that when, you know, when your local, your most visible media is not a, a, a nonprofit. I will defer to you guys first. And then before I chime in my own opinion. Vincent, if you may. <laughs> I'm not sure how to. <laughs> well, I mean, the, there are lots of, you can make grants to um, commercial entities and you might need a fiscal sponsor. Um, there are groups that can help you with that sort of work and we could connect people along those lines. Th that is done. Uh, um, but I would also just acknowledge like there are um, national organizations of all of the different types of media outlets. So, INN, the Institute for Nonprofit News, Lion Publishers, the Local Media Association, and all of them can help you connect with commercial or non-commercial outlets. And certainly the Black press, let's just say the Black press is largely commercial and is very much in need of support, particularly in these kind of times, um, for philanthropic support. And that can be done. I'll just assert that uh, as something that can and should be done as well. But Paul, it sounds like you have a good answer for your own question well, too. Aside from nonprofit, there's also your local public media that you should be supporting. Really a great way to just assert sort of your, you know, role for local media is be a subscriber to your local media. 
and write to your editor, write to the publisher, right? Because that's how they know, because you are a customer of local news. If you're a customer, you should tell them as your customer, this is what I like to see more of, right? So I think part of it is I'm encouraging everyone, you know, you don't, even if you're not like making grants, be a subscriber of your local media and engage with them. Like on a regular, if there's coverage that you like, let them know. If there's more coverage that you want to see, let them know. Because literally it's important for your local media to get community feedback, right? If they don't hear from you, then they can't assume. Um, so there's many different ways for everyone to get involved beyond the grant making. Um, let's see. Um, so this is a question sort of around some of these technology. And so as we think about things like Wikipedia and ChatGBT, like how do you, you know, especially, you know, for um, Puyang and Glenn, how do you see these new information sources Right. And even your local NGO who are not, um, you know, a, a media outlet, what do you see their role in the ecosystem of assisting sort of journalists to shape a better story for disaster recovery? What do you see their role in that? Is a question like where we see AI tools coming into not just AI tools, but um other information sources that is not your local news? Like how, how do you see them being part of the ecosystem of information? Um, I think that it's a matter of them showing that their, their information is of quality. And once they've done that, I, I think they become trusted sources. If you know that, you know, your county commission office provides the strongest information about um, preparedness for for uh, tornadoes, you go there as well as you going to the local TV station. It's, it's a matter of, of proving that you're um, worthy of trust, I guess. Um, Wikipedia, I think, is... You know, it is a great place to start. It's not necessarily the place you want to end up. And a lot of Wikipedia is just packed with sources for you to double check their information and make sure that everything there is true. And yeah, I, this, I, yeah I'm sorry. If I could just add, like I, I remember during Hurricane Harvey, maybe the most popular account that people followed for weather news was actually not any local media it was the uh what is his name um matt something but he he was like the weatherman of um i don't think he worked for an actual publication but he was like he he like studied weather pattern and he had such a great like following online people were like constantly retweeting him i mean he even became like a source for the local media so you know kind of going to that like quality information like that's what it comes down to and um, you know, I think there's there's space for it all. Um, a lot of times, what you're going to see is, you know, we, we get tips. For example, like a journalist is going to go and try and find out, like, to what extent how how accurate um, the tip is. Um, so you're always going to need journalists, but you know, we we're, we're open. I would like to say. And um, you know, we have five more minutes, so this is maybe one of the last question is really about attention span. Um, not just news about sort of everybody, right? So as our collective, you know, um, from, from Brian um, Coaster, his question is, as our collective attention span seem to be shrinking, especially with the evolution of social media and how people consume news, what can both news outlet and communicators do to keep attention on these critical areas that de still deserve attention after the immediate impact? Um, While they're thinking, maybe I'll just offer, because uh, I'm sure they'll have good examples, but I'll just uh, offer a suggestion that from the philanthropic point of view, I think it's important to understand the full range of media forms and, um, you know, that social media um, and long form are all part of the, 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 the total web. And, and I just recall 
early days at Frontline, um, where there was a question of like, is um, Twitter and Facebook uh, eroding the interest in your long form documentary? And David Fanning, uh, back uh, the, the founder of Frontline said, no, quite the opposite. That's actually driving more interest. So if you're active in small form social media, if you're vibrant in those in TikTok and all of those places as a media outlet, be conversant with the all the people who are using those and then bring them back to your long form. And so philanthropy has to support every part of the web, um, the, 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 the system, um, to to support the the dialogue between long and short and the different the different modes of expression. Yeah, and I think that um, I think that uh, Hu Ying's example of uh, the year the the look af of a year after Harvey, I'm sure that grabbed a lot of attention, as much as it, as much as a a clever tweet about something is going to grab someone's attention the amount of time that they give to a certain issue or to a certain uh story depends on the quality of that story and also how strong it is in, in maintaining someone's attention I, I think that challenges journalists to come up with ways to keep things interesting and to come up with new ways of attracting attention and keeping it and just looking through the comments, and this will be sort of my last question. Um, you know, um, a lot of people who are joining in are also grantees of CDP, right? So they are different NGO that's first serving local communities. You know, what is your message um, for them so that they could actually engage with their local news and be able to say, hey, this story deserves attention. This story deserves coverage because there is that view that it seems like media only cover sort of um you know the 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 big systems right or like the big businesses even during disaster and not necessarily looking at the community struggle or the local sort of um the local nonprofit that is serving these community like how best what is their pathway to to capture the attention so that journalists could cover them better or cover the work that they do better. Um, I'll, I'll start. I, I think that uh, they need to make sure that they have, th that they do as much of the legwork for the journalists that they can. Uh, you, you need to have your facts all gathered. You, you need to have your interviews all set the one of the biggest problems for journalists is that they just don't have enough time they might see a great story but they don't have enough time to cultivate it uh, because they have to do five other things before in that same time frame uh helping them out as much as they can uh is is very useful as well as if you're looking for uh if you're looking to pitch to a TV station, you need good visuals. If you're looking to pitch to a radio station, you need good audio. You need to give them what they need in order to, for them to help them do the thing that you're, you're looking for. If I could just say, maybe take a twist on your question. Um, in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of a disaster, philanthropy shouldn't wait by the phone until somebody from a media outlet calls out to them. And I just wanna correct something I said earlier in the broadcast of, of this because it's relevant here. Actually, uh, it was our communications director, Nina Sachdev, who reached out to the Honolulu Civil Beat when she saw what was happening and said, what are you doing? What do you need? And she was able to make the connection with CDP in that direction. So I'm corrected for, um, we didn't sit back and 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 wait to to hear what we we could do, uh, and and I would say that philanthropy should have the same same approach, and that is not lean into the editorial integrity to get in the middle of the coverage, but how can we help? How can we provide resources? How can we help you find resources to do your work? 
And thank you so much. Just remember, there is a lot more of you out there than there are journalists. And so some, you know, I would say be patient. Uh, no, we can't do it now. It doesn't mean no, we couldn't do it forever. And so I would say like, just be persistent in making sure that um, you get to us uh, as journalists. And with that, um, I want to thank the panelists today for your insights. Um, as for those who are staying on, just want to let you know that CDP does provide numerous resources to assist you in planning disaster grant making. Um, there's a monthly newsletter full of information and regular blogs, including our weekly What We Are Watching blog that highlights disaster worldwide. CDP staff is always available to provide guidance. And if you need more in-depth assistance, we will also be here to provide any various consulting services. And you can find more information on our work at disasterphilanthropy.org. And as a teaser for our next webinar on March 14, um, this could be a fun one, From Pets to Heroes, The Roles of Animals in Disaster Response and Recovery. So on a lighter note than the crisis of journalism. Thank you. <laughs>